Good morning, everyone. Welcome to At Your Service. I am your host, Alan Carpenter. Very pleased to have on the line with me Dr. Brian Doner, the CEO and co-founder of Compassionate Certification Centers, a healthcare provider group offering educational resources and assistance to patients by providing comprehensive medical cannabis cert- certifications to those who qualify, as well as a cannabis diagnostic tool and an ERMR system. And we'll explain what uh, some of those things are as we get to know Dr. Doner. Good morning, doctor. Good morning. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Absolutely. It is such a fascinating and burgeoning field, Uh, not just uh, medical marijuana, but also uh, CBD oil and the products derived uh, from the cannabis plant. Uh, We'll get into some of that today, but let's begin by talking about who you are. Uh, You've got a very extensive background, and I would have read it in the introduction, but I didn't want to use up the whole half hour. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I appreciate it. Well, a little bit about my background. I'm, I'm a board-certified emergency physician, and uh, I've done some fellowship training as well, and I was a, a big clinical researcher. And that's really how I, I personally came involved from a medical cannabis standpoint is during residency, I was able to, to take a look at a lot of the research, particularly out of, out of Israel, and then we saw what was happening in our country. Um, and we felt that, that by putting together a, a network or group of providers that we could provide uh, excellent and ongoing care with regard to medical cannabis for patients, and particularly here in Pennsylvania. And Compassionate Certification Centers, exactly what does CCC do? Sure. So CCC is basically a full-service medical cannabis healthcare organization. What I mean by that is we have brick-and-mortar clinics currently located in Pennsylvania where patients are able to come and see some of our staff and one of our physicians, get evaluated and certified for the medical marijuana process here in Pennsylvania, and then also we're able to provide ongoing support and care just like any other specialty physician um, would would do. We also incorporate uh, hemp-derived CBD sales Mm -hmm. into our integrative process, and then we've also uh, started to integrate clinical research from a medical medical cannabis standpoint uh, into our organization. So those are really our the three mainstays of what the Compassionate Certification Centers does. And as we all know, uh, it, it sort of depends on the state uh, how these uh, issues are treated and how these substances are treated, and, and the availability depends on, on state policy. What's happening in Pennsylvania with the medical marijuana program, and where, where do you think we're headed next? Sure. This is a great question. Obviously, a hot topic. So uh, Pennsylvania's medical marijuana program has been active and, and live for, for just over a year. And actually, it's, it's been off to a fantastic and very robust start. Uh, I think there's been uh, over 100,000 patients who have uh, registered for their medical cannabis card in, in Pennsylvania, and about 80,000 or so have been certified. I think there's uh, over 1,000 physicians that have signed up, which mm-hmm. really, when you look at historical historical numbers, Pennsylvania is, is, is ahead of the curve. I think Pennsylvania has also been very uh, um, progressive with regard to their medical marijuana program. If you look since its induction, they've really done uh, some things to add and try to make it uh, uh, even better. So, for example, adding things like the whole flower or the leaf uh, available to patients. Mm -hmm. Um, Also adding uh, new qualifying conditions, such as uh, opiate addiction substitution therapy. And then I think the final thing with Pennsylvania is really their commitment to to clinical research. Uh, I know there's been a few snags in the the program thus far, but really the long-term plan is to have a robust research program in Pennsylvania with regard to medical cannabis. So, in my opinion, I think the state is off to a, a very good start. It's kind of interesting to think back uh, not that long ago. Of course, we live in rapidly changing times, but not that long ago, uh, the average person at home, and we've all dealt with uh, uh, pharmaceuticals that gave us side effects. We've all dealt with pharmaceuticals that that, uh, uh, this one didn't work for this person, but it works for the other person. It can be very complex. And, and, And we would see like glaucoma patients. Uh, being treated with 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 cannabis and cannabis derived uh, substances and having good luck, or people who are on chemotherapy, and I think a lot of people at home kind of scratch their heads and say, "Well, hold on a second. If this is this is natural, this is effective for these people, and there's no chance of overdose, or there's no chance of toxicity." Uh, as there are with some uh, of pharmaceuticals. And so when, when the uh, medical marijuana program sort of got off the ground, I think there were those who, who were really surprised to find out how natural and safe these products are. 
I, absolutely. I, I couldn't agree more. And really, when, when you look about the history of cannabis, not only in our country, but, but across the globe, it's, it's been used medicinally and been done so safely for over a thousand of years. Uh, uh, really, the stigma in, in our country started to, to develop in the, the late 1800s yes. and in the early 1900s. Before that time, the uh, medical cannabis preparations were supported by physicians, pharmacists, uh, uh, and everything uh, in between. So uh, you've seen a, a, a rapid sort of progression. And, and to me, what I find the, the, the most appealing and fascinating is, is really the medical cannabis movement has been something that's, that was initiated by patients. I think traditionally in modern medicine, the, these type of movements are initiated by researchers, doctors, or healthcare mm-hmm. organizations. But uh, medical cannabis is, is different. And that in itself is a very powerful thing because it almost uh, indicates a, a paradigm shift in, in, in the healthcare uh, in our country and, and the way we go about it. So I, I personally find that uh, very appealing that medical cannabis is really a, a patient centered or focused therapy. Right. And, and, and speaking about, about cannabis, and, and I think if people are listening and maybe, you know, do, maybe they never experimented when they were in college, so forth and so on. And they're saying, you know, for medical marijuana, uh, do I have to smoke it? Uh, certainly not. Correct. Absolutely. That, and that's probably one of the biggest misconceptions. So for medical marijuana to be uh, used, not only do you not have to smoke it, but there also does not have to be a psychoactive effect right. um, or, or what people would call that, that feeling stone. Uh, um, really, there's multiple different routes of administration uh, with medical marijuana. There's able, we're able to, to control and have ideas uh, about the different profiles that we call the cannabinoid profiles of uh, medical marijuana. So, And this isn't a one-size-fits-all type mm-hmm. therapy program. Each individual, um, we really work with them about what, what route of administration, what cannabinoid profile, what frequency, what medications really would be best for their disease process or symptomatology. But your statement's absolutely true. You do not have to smoke marijuana or in, inhale it for it to be used uh, uh, medicinally. And then I also tell people you do not have to have that psychoactive effect whenever you're using uh, uh, cannabis medicinally as well. And what's really exciting about it from the potential of it being able to help a maximum number of people to me is when you have a medical marijuana program, the substances are standardized. You know how much of each uh, part of the, the uh, cannabis oil is is in each product, and, and the products can be tailored, as you said, for, for different conditions. Let's talk about some of the qualifying conditions. There are right now in this state, I believe, 21. Is that right? Correct. So tell me about some of the conditions that are qualifying for uh, medical marijuana right now. Absolutely. I, I think sort of one of the biggest things that you see about the conditions, just as a broad statement that in Pennsylvania are approved for, for medical marijuana, is that these are difficult to to treat disease entities or processes. This isn't uh, um, like we had uh, bronchitis or a sprained ankle. These are things such as uh, Lou Gehrig's disease, recurrent seizures, uh, autism, chronic pain. And and really the key note about that is these are disease processes or entities that traditionally in modern medicine, our therapies have been ineffective and Mm -hmm. or potentially toxic at some time. So I think when you look at Pennsylvania out of the 21 conditions, the most common condition would be chronic pain pain, which is essentially defined as any, any condition that's causing pain that has been present for greater than three months. So you can imagine there's some broad variability in that. Mm -hmm. Um, Recurrent seizures and epilepsy, uh, autism, PTSD, Lou Gehrig's disease, Huntington's chorea. Um, Recently, uh, um, opiate addiction substitution therapy was added. Um, This was a a really, really big deal, as I think Pennsylvania was essentially the first state to do that. But we're now able to use medical marijuana as a tool in battling the, the opiate epidemic. And I think thus far it's been very effective. So um, for, for anybody who's interested, the State Department of Health has a list of all 21 conditions mm-hmm. um, on their website. These conditions will also be updated and added to as, as time goes on and as approved by the State uh, Medical Marijuana Advisory Board. Yeah, and if people don't have any, uh, you know, they, they, they don't know much about uh, uh, marijuana versus other drugs, and maybe, maybe they're just listening for the first time to uh, somebody talk in depth about it. Uh, the opiate replacement is really interesting because, as I mentioned, there is no such thing as an overdose 
uh, with 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 uh, with cannabis. Um, so w- when you're talking about somebody shifting off of these things that do become highly toxic and dangerous very quickly to the human body to cannabis, that's a sea change for that person. Absolutely, it is, and I think to piggyback off of your point that you said, it's really a profound thing in medicine and pharmacology that there is no lethal or toxic dose of cannabis. So, yes. a human being cannot take enough marijuana to 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 die, right? And that is uh, um, in pharmacology so far. That's really a profound thing. I remember um, we, we we have a large medical cannabis event every year. In the last two years, Dr. Cyril Wecht. Um, has come and, and spoke, and obviously mm-hmm. one of the, the most renowned forensic pathologists in the entire world. And I'll never forget a statement that he made that out of the tens of thousands of autopsies he, he's done, never once ha- has has uh, acute cannabinoid toxicity been listed as the as the cause of death. Um, so from a safety profile, it's profound. From from with regard to the opiate epidemic. I think that we really, as a country, need additional tools to to battle this. As an emergency doctor, this is something that I'm I'm, I'm very up close uh, and and familiar with. And and what me- medical cannabis offers the opportunity is sort of to treat people on twofold. Many many patients have uh, got got into opiates secondary to chronic pain. Uh, so obviously, the cannabis is able to really take the place of opiates and treat that pain. In addition, we know now that cannabis can help to, to quell or decrease the, the symptoms uh, of acute opiate withdrawal, both mm-hmm. from a, a physical as well as, as well as a psychological standpoint. Um, so I, I think it's a tremendous tool that we now have, and, and the results that, that we've seen so far on the ground level in our office have been tremendous. And again, just to clarify terms a bit or to familiarize people with the field, uh, a lot of people are confused between uh, CBD oil derived from hemp and, and the, the products at the dispensaries. Tell me what the difference is. Absolutely. So you probably hear me reference a lot what are called cannabinoids, and, and the cannabinoids are really largely uh, the active ingredients in, in, in cannabis. Our body, all human beings and mammals, as a matter of fact, have an endocannabinoid system that, that really it's a, a system of these, these chemicals and these receptors where, where they can bind and they can become physiologically uh, active at that point. There's a lot of confusion um, out there whenever people see uh, CBD products may be sold at the local pharmacy or at the local convenience store mm-hmm. versus the medications that are sold at the dispensary. Really, the, 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 the most basic delineation between those are the, the medications that are sold at the dispensary are what we would call full spectrum. So they have all the cannabinoids in them, including THC, and they're mm-hmm. derived from the, the female marijuana plant. Conversely, when you see CBD-only products that are sold outside of the dispensary, those likely are derived from the hemp plant, which is uh, essentially a species of marijuana, but by definition, it is very high in CBD, which is one of the cannabinoids, otherwise known as cannabidiol, and also very low in THC. So that's really the delineation of when when patients uh, are out there and they're looking at these different products. Um, Hemp-derived CBD-only products are the more common products that you can see sold outside of dispensaries. Any product that's sold at the dispensaries is what we call full spectrum and will contain many, many cannabinoids, including THC. And I think it's also important to know when people, if, if people are thinking of, of trying out CBD, and I think that's what a lot of people feel safe with trying um, in, in the beginning, especially if you have, uh, you know, your pain isn't chronic or you just want, want, want help with anxiety or so forth. Uh, I happen to use it myself, uh, but you sort of need to know where you're getting it from because you might get uh, a CBD produced by uh, a small company or someone that, that isn't standardized and doesn't have the strength that they bill it as. So it's important to know where you get it. This is so true, and I think you had hit on this point earlier as well. Whether whether it's CBD products or whether it's products at the dispensary, all of us as patients and consumers have the right to know what we're putting into our body, and, and that's imperative. So mm-hmm. all of these medications, whether from the dispensary, whether from the outside, should be lab tested um, to really to make sure that the patients are getting what's said that they're getting and that there's no toxins in there, such as uh, heavy metals, pesticides, or that type of thing. Now, at all the, in Pennsylvania, the program is set up on um, that all when you go to the dispensary and a patient purchases their, their medication, that all the ingredients are listed. It's been lab tested numerous times and it's mandated by the state. Yes. However, 
With the hemp-derived CBD products, that's not really always the case. So what I always encourage my patients to do, whoever you're buying your CBD from, ask to see the lab testing sheets. Any company that's legitimate should be able to produce that to you um, very quickly and very easily, and then that can confirm what you're taking is, is what they tell you that you're taking. Right. And, and I should add that uh, compassionate certification centers do offer uh, CBD products. Um, and, and people might think we're familiar with the oil uh, that you put under your tongue, but you've also got capsules, gummies, uh, salves, patches. I mean, if you've got a sore muscle, you can apply a salve with CBD directly to that muscle if you're, if you're feeling anxious about maybe using a tincture or something. That's absolutely correct. And, and we've seen CBD have tremendous results for very common and daily uh, maladies, things such as anxiety, insomnia, muscles, aches and pains, uh, osteoarthritis, those type of things. So CBD is really a wonderful and a very gentle uh, uh, introduction to, to medical cannabis. It's non-psychoactive. Mm-hmm. It's, non, uh, it's not addicting. And it can be effective for, for many different symptomatologies. As you mentioned, just like the rest of uh, medical marijuana, there's there's numerous different forms of CBD that can be taken, um, whether those be oral, topical, inhaled, um, transdermal. And, and what we try to do at Compassionate Certification Centers is guide our patients towards what the best and most effective route administration and dosing parameters would be um, when they start on a CBD-based regimen. It's interesting, just this week, just anecdotally speaking, doctor, just this week, uh, two of my friends uh, told me interesting stories about just their their uh, experience with CBD. One of my friends has been able to go basically uh, off his seizure meds um, because of the because of regularly using CBD. Another friend of mine has found that even though he was using CBD for um, anxiety basically and to relax, he found that his blood pressure had gone down. Now, the, the drugs they give us, those of us like me who suffer from hypertension, the drugs they give us have a lot of side effects. If we can bring that down with CBD and no side effects, what a boon that is. It would be something that's amazing, and I, I think this is a wonderful example that, that, that you gave, that, that uh, this patient in particular was diagnosed with hypertension, and, and really, potentially, maybe it was the, maybe it was the anxiety or that mm-hmm. angst that was really driving the high blood pressure, and we've seen that many times in the past. So when, when you use a medication like uh, medical cannabis and you're actually treating the root cause of the problem versus the symptoms that it's producing, it's really the I- ideal treatment plan. And, and one of the things is that obviously right now we're doing tons and tons of research on, on medical cannabis, um, uh, whether it, it would be on, on cancer or, or diabetes or mm-hmm. pain. And I think as time goes on, the therapeutic benefits that we're going to find from, from this plant are going to be even more tremendous than we know about today. Because essentially, and correct me if I'm wrong, doctor, because I often am, but uh, correct me if I'm wrong, whether it's CBD or, or medical marijuana, both have very powerful and anti-inflammatory properties, correct? That's, uh, that's absolutely correct. And when you look at the, the components of, of medical marijuana, what I referenced before, those, those cannabinoids, these are things like THC and CBD and CBG. And all of these cannabinoids are found, found in the plant naturally. And they can bind to these receptors in the body. But what you find is each of these different cannabinoids has some different physiological effects. So, for example, we know that CBD is a a very good anti-inflammatory and that it's an anxiolytic and reduce that. Conversely, we know that THC can be a very good analgesic and great for pain. We know it can be a tremendous appetite stimulant. So, really, what we're doing now is trying to, to, as scientists, figure out not only specifically what these these cannabinoids' role is, but how they work together in unison and harmony, something that we call the, the, the entourage effect, where really one plus one one isn't always two um, right. in medicine or science. So uh, to me, it's a, it's, it's a fascinating thing. And as time goes on, we're really going to be able to, to sp- specify this on an individual basis for patients even more. It really is interesting because when I think of the overarching principle of, you know, an anti-inflammatory substance, uh, and one thing that's interesting to me about CBD is, sure, you might think my muscles are inflamed or I have a headache, so I'll, I'll, I'll you know, maybe use some CBD and, and have that reduced. But it's also inflammation like eczema. It's also effective against that kind of inflammation. 
Absolutely. We've had uh, patients with eczema, uh, with psoriasis, with many topical or, or dermatitis type issues who we've treated with topical preparations of medical cannabis and they've had uh, tremendous results. And, and oftentimes, this is why I appreciate be, having the opportunity to, to speak on the radio. Oftentimes, so many patients don't even know that this therapy may be applicable to mm-hmm. them or whatever symptoms that, that they're dealing with. So I encourage people so much to really uh, talk to somebody, talk to some providers, find out some research because the, the, the treatment that they've been hoping for could literally be right around the corner and they just don't even don't even know it yet. If people are, are listening and, and saying, well, you know, maybe maybe it's time I start thinking about getting a mer- medical marijuana card. What is the process? How do you how do you begin Sure. So it can be somewhat of a of an intimidating and cumbersome process, to be honest, for, for folks who really aren't familiar with it. But really, the, the first thing that I guide people to is to the state website, the Department of Health website, which gives a very good overview of the medical marijuana program. In order for a patient to be um, uh, approved for medical marijuana in Pennsylvania, they obviously need to have one of the, the 21 qualifying conditions. They will need to get registered with the State Department of Health, the the, the patient medical marijuana registry. They will need to see a provider, a physician who is listed on the Pennsylvania uh, physician medical marijuana Mm -hmm. uh, list. Uh, And then they'll have that card issued to them. And then once they receive their medical marijuana identification card, they take that to the dispensary, at which point they will meet with one of the pharmacists there. And that's where the actual medication is dispensed. Uh, Much of this process is done uh, online, which can be difficult for um, sometimes some of our elderly patients or folks who aren't as as computer savvy uh, at Compassionate Certification Centers. Our staff is able to walk patients through the entire process. So usually all we need to do is have people pick up the phone, call our 800 number, uh, and then our staff can walk them through the process from from A to Z. And also, I I guess we we referenced this earlier, but I kind of want to stress it for people who maybe are a little bit older or maybe find this to be, you know, kind of a whole foreign idea, but they're intrigued because they know it's effective. Tell me about some of the delivery systems. I mean, obviously, you don't, as we said, you don't have to smoke it. What are some of the other ways that, that you can ingest it? Absolutely. So I, I like to break down for my patients. Really, in, in Pennsylvania, there's four different options of administration of the medical cannabis. So the first one would be the, the whole flower or the leaf marijuana. And typically, um, this is used by, by patients with more experience. Mm-hmm. Technically, in Pennsylvania, it is not allowed to be smoked. It would have to be vaporized or it would have to be cooked with. Um, the other preparations, the other three are what we call the concentrated preparations. So imagine that you take the marijuana plant that you grow it and then you extract all the active ingredients from it and put it into a different delivery vehicle. Three options for these. One would be inhaled, one would be oral, and one would be topical. Mm -hmm. Um, The inhaled preparations typically work very fast, so their onset of action is rapid, but they don't last a long time. The oral preparations, conversely, sometimes take a long time to kick in or take effect, but yet they could provide extended relief, say six to eight hours. Mm -hmm. The topical preparations fall somewhere in between, but the wonderful thing about those is that because there's minimal absorption into the bloodstream, essentially uh, with topical preparations, there's no psychoactive component to them. And most of our patients, to be honest, will use these different routes of administration in combination, depending on their symptoms depending on the, the social situation or the time of day. And again, these are things that, that we go through with our patients in detail. But uh, just to hit your point again, you absolutely do not have to uh, smoke it or inhale it. It can be taken orally, topically, transdermally, that type of thing. And I'm really, I and again, I'll, I'll just speak from personal experience as a user of, of CBD products. I'm really sort of intrigued and impressed by how CBD can help you feel relaxed feel more content uh, without a making you sleepy like say a, a, a Paxil or you know a, a, a benzo drug would it doesn't do that but number two you don't feel high at all you don't feel uh, uh, intoxicated at all um, it's really intriguing how you have that feeling of wellness but you don't have any sort of intoxicating overtones to it I guess I'd say 
Absolutely, and, and you're 100 percent correct. Uh, CBD is uh, completely non-psychoactive, and interestingly enough, when you look at the marijuana plant, there's there's over a hundred of these cannabinoids that that we have uh, discovered already: THC, CBD, CBG, CA, or uh, CBN. Really, the interesting thing: THC is the only uh, one that has any psychoactive properties to it. But I think it's important to note too that that, that THC really isn't the black sheep of the medical marijuana family in yes. that in that it has some very good and in, in therapeutic properties to it uh, but it just uh, just like anything else you don't need to have too much of a good thing sometimes but yeah CBD is a is a, is, a, is a tremendous molecule um, and really uh, it's something that the therapeutic values of it are so so high um, and any type of uh, negative consequences is extremely low I would say compared to traditional pharmaceuticals that we're used to as our time together uh, kind of winds down uh... Uh, I just want to say that if people are listening and maybe never thought that medical marijuana is the route they should take, they should really look into it and really consider it. Because, again, um, we're talking about a natural substance, one that is has no potential for toxicity and times are changing. And I think healthcare needs to change with it. Uh, if people want to get in touch with uh, Compassionate Certification Centers, how do they do it? I think that probably the easiest way is to go to our website, which is CompassionateCertificationCenters.com. There they can uh, arrange for an appointment. They can sign up on their own. They can talk to one of our folks through our online chat system, or our toll-free 888 number is listed on that uh, website as well. Any of those three uh, uh, routes... Patients can find as much information as they like, and they can be directed to one of our staff members who can answer any questions and walk them through things further. Fantastic. Dr. Brian Donerbid, great talking to you. Fascinating stuff. Thank you so much Thanks for joining so much us. Thanks for your time. You have a great weekend, sir. Thanks, you too. And thank you for listening. 